So as we wait for uh, people to to join here, just a quick announcement about next month's meeting or next month's webinar. I believe it'll be December the second. Um, and we did have one scheduled that that we were excited about, but it's going to have to be postponed. So uh, recently, I asked if Owen Gorman and Amanda Ackes would like to present on some of their recent findings about Lake Superior, Deepwater Cisco diversity and some really exciting findings that they presented at um, at JASM back in May. And so Owen and I believe Amanda have agreed to do that. Owen, I don't know if you're there, you wanna flip on your camera. Um, do you have like a tentative, tentative title for that? Oh, okay, there we go. Hey, uh, tentative title, not yet. <laughs> Okay. It'd probably be similar to what we had before, which is not rolling off my tongue here, but. <clears throat> but it'll be a about... great talk. It was well, I mean, we got to sell it here, Owen. It'll be a great talk. <laughs> Had some really interesting findings about Corgonus Ragardi, the short nosed Cisco that blew a lot of people's minds. So um, Nick will be developing a registration link there he's already got it boom he's fast uh, for you to uh, get more information and register for next month's december 2nd seminar so thanks to owen and amanda for stepping up and uh, giving us a, a really good webinar to end this calendar year uh so any thanks i see a thumbs up from amanda so today we're really excited um we actually had a record number of registrations so we're expecting a good turnout here for uh, a tag, tag team webinar. Uh, the sort of the, the broader title is Collaborative Efforts to Advance Understanding of Corrigonian Population Dynamics Across the Great Lakes. And our first presenter will be Taylor Brown. And she'll be talking about um, some life history parameter or a life history parameter database that she's been working on over the past year with many colleagues. And then Andrew Hanzi will, and then we'll we'll actually pause. Then we'll sort of have five or ten minutes for questions based on Taylor's presentation, and that'll set up nicely. Then Andrew Hanzi's presentation, following that, which is kicking off a cross basin analysis of Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment drivers and dynamics, and then we'll have some time after Andrew's you know twenty or so minute talk for uh, discussion for his. So with that, uh, let me just introduce Taylor first. So Taylor um, actually got her bachelor's degree uh, where I got one of my graduate degrees at Ohio State University, or so they say on Monday Night Football, the Ohio State University um, in ecology and evolution. So Taylor from OSU got her bachelor's, she got her master's in natural resources at Cornell University. Uh, working with Dr. Lars Rustam and Sarish Sethi. Uh, she studied environmental drivers, explaining spatial variation in Corrigonian larvae in Lake Ontario, and has a few papers out from that that are really quite, in, quite good. And today you'll learn, and she's a PhD student, and today you'll learn about, um, actually with the same advisors, and you'll learn more about her research. Um, it's presented part of this uh, webinar today. So Taylor, thanks so much for joining us. And are you able to share your screen? Okay. I'll get that set up here. All right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining. I'm really excited to share this project with you all. Um, and I I'm here on behalf of my co-author team, and I want to thank all of them for helping make this work possible, including the countless hours that they spent digging through papers and reports to populate this database. And I also want to acknowledge that the funding for this work came from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I want to thank the members of the PBA science team who helped uh, develop this project, um, and to thank everyone who contributed data, um, including those who sent over papers that we didn't have access to or who scanned over the old reports they had hidden away in their filing cabinets. And I want to start off by really just uh, 
saying that this is a tool for the community to use. And that's why I'm here today is to tell everyone about it. Um, and so as I'm going through and talking about this database, I want you to think about how you might use these data to tackle all of your burning questions about Great Lakes Carrigonines. And I'm going to start off by briefly introducing the Carrigonine Restoration Framework. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's in brief an adaptive management framework that provides a model for science-based restoration of Carrigonine species in the Great Lakes. And one of the tasks in that framework, um, this one that I'll zoom in here, is to compile data to conduct population viability um, for helping inform restoration interventions that might be uh, most appropriate. And so to uh, accomplish that task, the population viability analysis or PVA science team was formed. Uh, the charge of that team uh, is to recommend methodology for PVAs for Great Lakes Craganines. And that team is led by co-chairs Brian Weidel and John Suica, um, along with a basin-wide team that um, help, uh, help implement this. And just to back up a second to explain why we're even talking about PVAs in the first place, um, at their core, PVAs are a quantitative approach for modeling future population growth trajectories under differing scenarios. I have an example from a, a paper I found up on the screen. And these can range from simple population growth models to adding in more complexity, including, um, including how we might expect populations to respond to future environmental conditions or to specific management interventions. Um, and you can add in spatially explicit dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. And because of all of this, PVAs are incredibly useful for exploring the efficacy of different management interventions uh, for increasing population growth or persistence. And some of the factors that might determine what specific kind of PVA model you use include the potential management actions that you're considering and what kinds of data are available for powering simple versus more complex models. But before we can recommend specific PBA methods for different Craigonine species and populations across the Great Lakes, we first need to know what kinds of data are available to inform these PBA models and how that data availability may vary among species and populations of interest. And so to resolve that knowledge gap, the idea for the life history parameter database was formed. Um, and so the goal of this was to compile all of the available uh, data for Carrigonine life history parameters that are out there, um, including things like growth, survival, maturation schedules, fecundity, and more. And while we were at it, to also make that publicly available uh, for the community to use. And so because we were trying to compile um, as much of the available data as we could, we took the approach of a systematic literature review to ensure that we were comprehensively capturing as much of the available data as possible. So we cast a pretty wide net for this literature review. Um, really, any sort of studies that were estimating population level life history parameters for any Corrigona species anywhere in the Great Lakes from any time. And so I have a few of those species listed on the screen here, including the Cisco's and Lake Whitefish. And some of the um, parameters we were looking for, I have on the screen here, but really we were looking for anything and everything that might be useful to include in a population model, including, but not limited to, specifically PBA classes of models. So some of the ones that I haven't already listed are things like exploitation, sex ratios, uh, gonadosomatic indices, size and age structure, morbidity to just sea lamprey, and more. The methods that we use to search for, identify, and extract that data uh, were drawn from best practices from the systematic review and meta-analysis literature. We first, of course, had to find these studies, and so we conducted structured searches in academic databases, looking for white literature, um, and dissertations. We also compiled all of the grade literature that we could get our hands on. Um, being a pretty large group of scientists who work in the Great Lakes um, and on Corregonines, we already had a lot of that in hand, and so we were able to compile that 
Um, but we also did things like track down cited reports, um, and we also had some data contributed directly from agencies as well. Um, we ended up with uh, 984 studies based on that, and then they were just quickly evaluated about whether or not they actually reported any data that we were interested in. Based on that, we ended up with 305 individual studies, and we extracted data from within the text, figures, tables, and appendices uh, as available, both data and metadata associated with those observations. And we organized those data into uh, relational CSV files. Um, we decided to choose CSV flat files because they're non-proprietary text files that can be used with any software of interest, whether that's Access, R, or even Excel, uh, with the idea of this, these files being accessible and preservable for the future. So uh, let's talk about what we actually found. Of those 305 references, over half um, came from the white literature and things like journal articles. Um, but we did have a, a pretty substantial amount of gray literature, things like agency reports or conference proceedings. And we had a handful of dissertations as well. Uh, we found and categorized about 10 uh, different types of life history parameters. So for example, um, all of the different measures of mortality or survival, we put into a single category and a single table in this data set. Um, so these categories include growth, mortality, maturity, reproductive potential, size at age, density, weight, weight length relationships, population level size and age structure, morbidity, and recruitment. And we ended up extracting about uh, over 32,000 individual life history parameter uh, observations. And I know that sounds like a lot, but that's because many of these parameters are reported separately for different stock, years, age classes, sexes, uh, you name it. And we captured all of that variability in this data set. And along with the data itself, we also reported any associated metadata, including any measures of statistical uncertainty, such as uh, standard error or confidence bounds, sample size, and any other important methodological details that were reported, including whether or not it, the data was derived from fishery dependent or independent uh, data sources, or what kind of age structure was used for some of the age specific parameters. And it was really exciting to see that the earliest years of data we found were back in 1900. So we have 120 years of data in this data set. But um, predictably, most of those estimates do come from more contemporary populations. Here, I just have um, a histogram of the uh, proportion of individual estimates by decade. And I have it partitioned with colors on rough time periods. So before 1970, uh, 1970 to 2000, and 2000 to present. Just to give you a rough idea of sort of these uh, historical versus more contemporary periods. In terms of how the available data varied across space, most of the estimates we found were derived from populations in the upper Great Lakes um, here on Michigan Superior with relatively few coming from the lower Great Lakes and very few coming from populations and connecting channels like the St. Mary's River or the St. Clair Detroit River system. And most of the data that we found described Lake Whitefish with over 60% of the individual data points being related to Lake Whitefish. Um, Bloater and Cisco were second and third on the list. And we found very few observations for Kai Ai um, and for Shore Jaw Cisco. Uh, so one of the implications of that is that population models for species such as these may have to borrow parameters from other species when building like a PBA model. And we also found data for some other species of ciscos, including short nose, black fin, and long jaw, whose statuses range from uncertain to extirpated to extinct. And so now I'm just going to uh, walk you through some examples of the data that we compiled and uh, walk through some summaries of some common parameters by species and water body um, and give you a sense of what kind of data are in this database and what we might be able to think about with those data. 
So just to orient you to the plot here before I uh, throw the data in your face, first we'll start with length at age. Um, and so we have age on the x-axis, length on the y-axis. Um, I have each species split out by a different panel. So from left to right, we have like whitefish, Cisco, floater, and Kayai. Um, and each color is a different lake. And I'm gonna show you the mean for each um, water body with uh, the standard error and the underlying data points used to generate that mean. And so here uh, is an example of what that data looks like. Um, so here we have length of age curve for each species and each water body. And with this data, we can start to make some superficial comparisons between species and lakes. So, you know, for example, uh, unsurprisingly, like whitefish have the largest length at age and maximum length, uh, followed by Cisco, uh, with floater and Kaya being pretty similar, and with also some variation among lakes within species. Um, but there's some pretty interesting questions that can emerge from this. Like, for example, if we look at this Kaya data, um, we have data for both Superior and Lake Michigan. And that Lake Michigan data is actually from the 1930s before the deepwater Cisco species became introgressed. Um, and so we have this really interesting historical versus contemporary comparison. And so that can generate research questions about whether or not those larger sizes at age that we see for Michigan are due to just fundamentally being from a different lake and a different population, or if it's due to some sort of ecosystem change over time. Um, next, uh, mortality, specifically here, I've, uh, I'm showing instantaneous total mortality. Um, and to reorient you again, now we have water body on the x-axis. And each individual data point shape is different according to each time period. So we can start to see how the parameter, how the um, observations themselves have changed over time. So data prior to 1970 is depicted using squares, 1970 to 2000 in triangles, and 2000 to present in uh, circles. And so we can see right off the bat, especially in comparison to some of that bloater and Cisco data, we have a, a lot of data for Lake Whitefish. Um, and for comparisons across lakes, we see the highest mortality in Michigan and Huron, though it looks like some of those patterns are at least partially driven by high historical exploitation um, with some of these really high historical uh, mortality rates. We have a fair amount of bloater data um, and again, we're seeing that high mortality in Michigan and overall very little mortality data for Cisco. Um, another key parameter, fecundity. Um, as you can see by just sort of the, other than for Lake, Lake Whitefish and Bloater in Lake Michigan, uh, there's not a lot of underlying data that's used to generate these points. So we have, you know, point estimates for Lake Whitefish, but we're limited on our understanding of the variability in fecundity. And um, it's even more limited for bloater with only, uh, we have a lot of data, but it's only for Lake Michigan um, and a similar story for Cisco with uh, some data in Michigan, Superior and Ontario. And lastly, uh, we have maturation schedules. So here I have both age and length at 50% maturity um, with age in the top row here and length in the bottom row. And this is interesting for making comparisons across lakes and thinking about what's driving these differences. For example, um, for Lake Whitefish, we see that for Lake Erie here, uh, Lake Erie fish have the youngest age and shortest length at maturity, followed by Ontario. But again, unlike the upper Great Lakes, there's not a lot of um, data for either of those lakes. And so we don't have a great understanding of the variability around those point estimates. And overall, uh, same story, few data for Bloater or Cisco. And so again, uh, in addition to sort of telling the story of the data itself, it, we can also identify some gaps in the published literature based on what we're not seeing. And I'll emphasize published there as well. Um, I echo, just to echo some of the things I was saying earlier, but um, estimates for some of those Cisco 
uh, species or species of Cisco's um, estimates for populations in the lower Great Lakes. Um, I'm pointing out mortality and survival here, but some of these parameter estimates are definitely biased by um, the available data being limited to fish stocks. And so we have less information for some of these parameters, um, mortality and survival being just one of them based on where commercial fisheries um, are operating and less information where they're not. And then um, there were a number of parameters that we expected to find more of. So here, um, pointing out morbidity due to sea lamprey, things like wounding rates. Um, that might be pretty important for some of these populations, but we really didn't find much public data on them. And some of these gaps are certainly unavoidable. You know, some of these species have been extirpated from certain lakes for a long time, or maybe weren't present there in the first place. But we know a lot of this data does exist. Um, these data are either directly observed or can be easily computed from routine fisheries assessments, but they're not published. As for the data set itself, uh, I'm excited to say it's coming soon to Science Space. Um, it's in review and it should be live soon. Um, and anyone can go and directly download the data and the metadata. And just to end with some uh, brainstorming, some potential applications for these data, of course, going to the original impetus for these data, uh, they can be used to generate these uh, life history inputs for population models, whether that's PVAs or otherwise. But the data set is more powerful than that with the amount of data we have in here and including conducting meta-analyses for how some of these populations have varied across space over time and among species. You can compare these data to populations outside the Great Lakes, whether that's populations uh, in more northern areas in Canada or to different Kragenian species in Europe and Asia. And of course, directing future research based on the data that's not currently in the database. And with that, I wanna encourage you to please use this data <laughs> um, and to reach out with any questions or project ideas. Um, I have the contact information for the masterminds behind this project, Brian Weidel and John Suica on the screen and my email's also there. And thank you. Great job, Taylor. <clears throat> That is a very impressive data set. Um, 305 references. Would, would you say like 30,000 records? 32,000? 30, 32,000 records. Um, I mean, my, I hadn't, obviously, I haven't seen this before, but I'm not surprised by the bias or not the bias, but the overwhelming amount of Lake Whitefish data. Um, but just some, in, in what you were able to present at a high level, I think there's a a lot there for, I think, as you said, cross lake comparisons or cross continent comparisons. We've had a lot of uh, webinars from Europe. And some of the whitefish, all the whitefish data you've compiled could be really interesting for their comparisons to their European whitefish species. So, and I love how you're emphasizing you know, the slide you have up right now. I want you to use the data. I mean, that's perfect and really glad to hear that'll be out soon, not only for the science teams developing the PVAs in the future, but, you know, for, for anybody's use. So great job. Um, if you have a question for Taylor, uh, we've got about five or 10 minutes to uh, do that. Let me open up my chat box to see if anybody's given any questions on chat. Um, okay, Marty Simonson. Oh, let's see, let me make sure that's the most recent one. Okay, so Marty is saying, um, Taylor, the histogram of data by decade shows low numbers of data in the 2020s, which is natural, but there's lots of new research ongoing. So what are the plans to keep this database live and updated? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, right? Um, something like this should be updated, right? Um, I it was... I'm only, you know, helping out with this project. So I will say that um, Brian Weidel and John Suica would have a better answer to that, but there are plans um, to regularly update this. Um, that is the idea. Um, the frequency of that or how often, I'm not sure, but yeah, it would be great for this to continue to be maintained. Um, yeah, we only have data through 2020, but obviously data keeps coming out year by year. 
Yeah, so that's a good answer. And I think that could be something that, I mean, I, I, maybe we don't do it year by year, but every five years, every 10 years, we sort of update it. Um, yeah, and as um, accumulate. I noticed that uh, Dave Fielder put in the chat that he had some data that he noticed we didn't have. And we expect that uh, people will look at the data set and say, oh, I have some data that isn't in this database and send it over. So that's also very welcome. Perfect. Yeah, one of the great things about doing this. Let's go to Owen, who uh, I don't know if he was first, but he's first on my sort of uh, screen here. Okay, I guess I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm assuming that uh, the age data is largely based on scale ages because yes. you know, it's uh, that's the standard going all the way back. So, and of course that can, that's always a caveat put out there about the fact as they get past up to maturity, we have lots of underestimation of age. So uh, I just was, that was one thing I was thinking of. Um, the other thing is I was, as you're doing this, I for many decades now, I've been working on trying to pull together data from Lake Superior. Um, and I'm just thinking of the last question about augmenting or updating this database. At some point, I hope before I retire that this will, will have a data release and make a lot of this life history parameter data available uh, from Lake Superior for all these uh, corrigonemes dating back to 1953. And, and Bo's probably familiar with my point about all this. The reason why this has been such a difficult problem with our historical data sets is that they recorded life history data on scale envelopes and not on the field records. And the two have been basically separated infinitely, you know, until somebody tries to put those two together. And that's been the process. So I'm confident that uh, we can perhaps augment that uh, more historical aspect of this database, and that would be quite useful for folks. Um, so anyway, that was just my thoughts there. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Um, I did do the breakdown. I think, yeah, you're right in that most of them are from scales. Uh, I don't remember the exact breakdown, maybe, I don't know, 70%, 30% between scales and odalis. So there is some in there, and that is designated in the database so that people you know, know that when they're using the data. And um, yeah, it'd be great to get some more data in here, um, especially as you were saying, you know, some of that data just didn't even make it into the field record, let alone the published data where we sort of left our scope, right? Um, but there's still a wealth of data out there that this is in no way all the data out there, but we tried to get as much of the public data as we could. <clears throat> so, Quickly back to the chat, and then we'll grab Peter's question, Taylor. So, I mean, what Dave Fielder mentioned in terms of a data set, you know, Wendy Stott's sort of asking a similar question. Um, if you if if there are relatively small data sets that can be added quickly, is it are you interested in adding those, or do you sort of consider this closed? Uh, what's the sort of status on to what extent this will be living for? A little bit or good for this data release or do you have a sense of that yet yeah um right so this data set is currently in review in its current form um and there is you know discussion about how frequently it's going to be updated um but the idea is to continue to update it um i'm not sure at what frequency or like in how big a batch of those will be but you know we knew for example that as soon as it's out there we'll get a flurry of data that people realize is missing and should be sent out. Um, I don't have a sense right now of how frequently that's going to be, but we definitely are very open to it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Peter. Hi. Hi, Taylor. Um, I, I mean, along the same lines as everybody, I guess. I know your focus was um, Great Lakes, but I'm just curious if during that meta-analysis, you found a lot of data for some of the more inland populations. I know some of those were, you know, colonized by Great Lake Cisco, and some of them are just really parallel populations. So curious about those samples. Yeah, we did find some. Um, there were a fair number. We excluded them pretty early in the process, though. Um, but we have a uh, Zotero library full of all of the references we looked at, even if they were rejected. So that could be used as sort of a resource for uh, future sort of, you know, looking for that data, whether that's inland on the US side or the Canadian side, there is some of that. Um, 
in the more database searches we were looking at, um, Great Lakes and each of the Great Lakes names were one of our search terms. So I'm not sure exactly how many we missed because of we were requiring that to be somewhere um, in the title and abstract. But yeah, there's definitely some of that out there. Maybe let's grab one more from the chat before we move on to Andrews. And we can always come back and ask Taylor more questions after Andrews talk. But uh, Ben Kissinger uh, asked, sometimes many of the species are not sort of uh, the target. Uh, maybe that's, I mean, can you comment on if that's true or not, given that you focus on the published literature? And more broadly, how did you sort of consider the like, QA, QC of the data? Mm -hmm. Did you assume that if it's published, that's sort of the Q QAQC enough for it? Yeah, Benjamin, that's a great point. Um, and that is sort of, it helps that we were just looking at the published literature because people were uh, using, you know, specifically that data versus just combing through and uh, looking through all this agency data. But it turns out they didn't actually record any of the non-target fish species, right? Um, so. It, it did tend to be sort of what data people specifically thought was important in regard to pregnant populations because that's what was bothered to be published and people went through the effort of publishing it. Um, in, sort of, in terms of how um, QAQC worked, um, yeah, we did sort of take the data as is in, in most cases. We did minimal standardization, but we did do a lot of QAQC. Um, Helen Takata Humacher led um, all of that, which was a piece of work, uh, but uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, we made sure that we weren't sort of duplicating data. So for some of these, like for dissertations, you know, they might uh, publish their dissertation and then, or, you know, write their dissertation and then take that chapter, minimally change it and turn that into a journal article. And so, for example, we, in terms of QACC, um, we limited how much data we duplicated in terms of extracting. Um, but that's probably the extent to the QAQC other than just like fixing weird bugs in the data. All right. Well, yeah, I well, can uh, concede it to Andrew here. Okay. I mean, if you wanted to answer a few of the questions over chat, um, that would be fine. Or we can come back to them later, Taylor. But Great job. Thanks for uh, letting everybody know about this uh, database. And so now we'll shift over to uh, Andrew Hanzi's talk. Andrew's going to be talking about a new project that he and Taylor are leading and have recently gotten funded. And they're sort of looking for wanting to let, again, wanting to let people know about this project and sort of getting a sense of to what extent um, they they are they are going to be testing sort of the right kinds of hypotheses and so uh you can read this title right there let me just quickly introduce you uh, to andrew andrew uh hansi got his bachelor's in biology at hillsdale college uh, in michigan he got his master's in uh, forestry and natural resources with a fisheries track at purdue university under uh, dr thomas hook uh, and then moved to Minnesota, where he got his PhD in ecology, evolution, and behavior with Dr. Uh, Paul Venturelli. And he stayed in Minnesota to do a postdoc with Gretchen Hansen. And we were fortunate enough to recruit or uh, to, to hire Andrew as a USGS fishery biologist in 2020. And he is one of the uh, three Corrigonian scientists at USGS that are uh, funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, along with Amanda Ackes and myself. So, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks uh, to you and to Taylor for pulling this together. Yeah, no problem. Thanks both for the introduction. Can you guys hear me okay and see my slides? Yep, yep. looks good. Good deal. Thank you. All right. Well, hi, everybody. As Bo said, my name is Andrew, and I'm a fish biologist with the USGS Great Lakes Science Center. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project that my collaborators and I are just getting underway related to analyzing recruitment drivers and dynamics of lake whitefish and Cisco stocks across the Great Lakes. So as you can probably tell by the lengthy list of co-authors here, uh, this is a really collaborative project. And I'd like to take a quick moment to thank all the co-PIs for their contributions thus far, 
especially Taylor, who you just heard from, uh, who's spearheading this work uh, alongside me as part of her PhD dissertation. Um, and I'd also like to thank the uh, Great Lakes Fishery Commission for funding this work. So I'll begin with some brief background information on Cisco and Lake Whitefish in the Great Lakes. Uh, as many of you know, uh, or as many of you probably know, uh, Cisco and Lake Whitefish are ecologically, economically, and culturally important fishes in the Great Lakes. Uh, for example, they perform key ecosystem functions such as transferring energy across both trophic levels and also habitats via uh, deal vertical and seasonal spawning migrations, for example. Uh, in addition, Lake Whitefish and Cisco historically supported some of the largest fisheries in the world. Uh, for example, the Cisco fishery in Lake Erie yielded approximately 20 million kilograms of fish per year in the early 1920s. Um, and their economic importance continues today. For example, whitefish still support the most valuable fishery in the Great Lakes. Uh, and finally, uh, Lake Whitefish and Cisco have been a key part of the lives and cultures of many tribal peoples in the region for thousands of years. Unfortunately, uh, Great Lakes Cisco and Lake Whitefish populations have declined in both distribution and abundance uh, across the Great Lakes compared to historical levels. So more specifically, uh, many Lake Whitefish stocks have declined following peaks in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, so as an example of that, uh, this is a figure showing Lake Whitefish biomass in Northern Lake Huron. And that biomass in recent years is approximately one sixth of what it was in the mid 1990s. Uh, so a pretty dramatic decline in that region since the 1990s. In addition, both the abundance and the distribution of most Cisco stocks have dramatically declined compared to historical levels. Um, and that's plainly evident in this figure, which shows the production or the annual fishery catch in thousands of pounds uh, through time for different Cisco stocks across the Great Lakes. Uh, so as a quick aside, I'll ask that you please note the differences in the scales for both the X and the Y axes in these figures. Uh, but as you can see, most Cisco stocks declined sharply in the early to mid 20th century. Uh, for example, the Lake Erie stock that supported that massive fishery that I mentioned earlier crashed in the 1920s, uh, rebounded a little bit in the 1940s, and then crashed again to the point that Cisco are now thought to be functionally extirpated from Lake Erie. The only Cisco stock that has persisted in significant numbers, albeit at a reduced abundance compared to historical levels, is the stock in Lake Superior, which happens to be the largest, deepest, coldest, and least disturbed of the Great Lakes. Likely causes for these declines include factors such as overexploitation, uh, habitat degradation, for example, uh, via sedimentation or nutrient runoff and other processes, uh, interactions with invasive species like alewife and rainbow smelt, and particularly for Lake Whitefish, the effective loss of key prey items like the benthic amphipod diparia, which has also declined significantly in recent years. Prompted in part by these declines, Lake Whitefish and Cisco are currently focal species for basin-wide management and conservation and restoration efforts. And one key aspect of these stocks that's a particular management concern and interest is that many populations of both species have been experiencing either declining and or highly sporadic recruitment. Uh, and the reasons for that poor recruitment are not very well understood. And this is partly because as with many fishes, Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment can be highly variable and may be driven by many factors. For example, Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment can be influenced by biotic factors like spawning stock size, uh, prey availability, especially in early life, and invasive species such as Dreisenin mussels and spiny water flea. Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment can also be influenced by abiotic factors like ice cover, which can help to, or which may serve to shelter eggs from wave energy and harmful radiation as they incubate over winter. Uh, temperatures during key times, for example, right after ice out in the spring. And also wind speed and direction, uh, which influences wave energy and advection or retention in nursery habitats. Um, so the complex nature of Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment and the factors that drive it can make things pretty difficult to understand. And this challenge is even further complicated by the fact that fish recruitment in general tends to be really variable and really hard to predict. Uh, so traditional approaches for understanding recruitment variability involve constructing relationships between stock size and recruitment, but these models are notoriously bad. Uh, and they often rely on assumed biological relationships that might not actually reflect reality. So I would argue that data-driven methods like machine learning approaches can help here. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why. 
For one thing, data-driven methods can help to identify the hidden trends and complex interactions that we expect to see with recruitment data. In addition, many data-driven approaches don't make assumptions about relationships between variables, uh, such as stock recruitment relationships, and they can accommodate many types of variable distributions. So for these reasons, I think that data-driven approaches can be flexible and powerful tools for helping us to better understand fish recruitment. And it's really critical for us to make efforts to better understand uh, Cisco and like whitefish recruitment, despite all of those challenges, uh, because identifying key recruitment drivers and improving our understanding of how those drivers influence recruitment is key for informing management and rehabilitation efforts for these species. In fact, disentangling the suite of complex ecological drivers that explain observed recruitment variability for both Lake Whitefish and Cisco has been identified as a critical knowledge gap for rehabilitation and management in the Great Lakes. So our project is designed to help address that knowledge gap, and it has four objectives. Uh, first, we'll generate standardized year class strength estimates for key Lake Whitefish and Cisco stocks in each of the Great Lakes, and also evaluate the extent to which recruitment is synchronized across populations and species. Next, we'll use data-driven approaches to identify and rank important biophysical drivers of year class strength, and infer how those drivers influence recruitment for each stock. We'll then determine biophysical drivers of recruitment synchrony specifically, uh, and also quantify how the importance and influence of drivers varies across spatial scales and time. And finally, we'll predict how year class strength will respond to projected shifts in climate due to climate change and identify which drivers are actionable for management versus which drivers might act as potential impediments to self-sustaining Cisco stocks, uh, Cisco and like whitefish stocks in the Great Lakes. So I'm gonna spend the remainder of the talk uh, talking about our proposed methods for each of these uh, objectives. And then also I'll give a few progress updates where applicable. So the stocks that we're targeting for this work are based uh, somewhat loosely on the proposed management areas for Lake Whitefish identified by Ebener et al. in their recent synthesis paper, which was published through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So as you can see here, uh, these proposed uh, management areas cover most of the Great Lakes Basin. So in addition to Great Lakes stocks, we are also considering including data from Lake Simcoe because Lake Simcoe has this wonderfully rich long-term data set, uh, both for Lake Whitefish and Cisco, as well as for environmental conditions and other relevant, relevant biological data. Uh, so comparing our results for Great Lake stocks to those of Simcoe stocks could help to provide additional insight and help us to better understand the mechanisms driving recruitment across scales and across systems. So as I mentioned, we're using that map of stocks to guide our data compilation efforts uh, but we're also leveraging the efforts of the uh, Pregnant Restoration Framework's Population viability, viability Analysis Science Team that Taylor just talked about uh, to aid in data compilation. Specifically, uh, the members of this team uh, work to compile information on surveys that are conducted across the Great Lakes. And so we use that information to help identify potentially useful data sets for our purposes. We then connected with uh, project co-PIs and data curators for those various data sets to get their opinions on the potential utility of those data for our purposes. And so through that process, we identified 54 prospective data sets across the lakes, and that includes coordinated surveys, some multi-agency surveys. Um, so we have six data sets identified for Lake Ontario, eight from Lake Erie, 11 from Lake Michigan, 10 from Lake Huron, and 19 from Lake Superior. And I was just informed earlier today that we have just sent out the uh, last of our data requests. So currently requesting is a little bit off. It's actually recently finished requesting data and we're working right now on compiling those data uh, and preparing them for analysis. So those Lake Whitefish and Cisco data will then be used to address our first objective, which is to generate standardized year class strength estimates. Uh, to do this, we're using a mixed modeling approach that incorporates data describing fish across multiple ages. Um, so I'm not usually a fan of showing equations in presentations, but this one isn't too complex and I'll walk through it. And I think doing so will help to explain our approach a little bit. Um, so on the left side, we have log transformed catch per unit effort. And on the right side, we have a fixed effect for fish age, random effects for year class and sampling year and an error term. Uh, so this approach has a few key advantages. Uh, for one thing, it incorporates data describing multiple ages instead of relying on just one index age. And so for that reason, I think it tends to generate more robust estimates of year class strength. Um, in addition, the sampling year random effect allows us to account for changes in catchability over time, which can be very useful. Uh, and moreover, uh, this approach can be used with a subset of ages. So for example, we can include only relatively young fish 
that are fully recruited to the gear in order to reduce issues associated with aging mounts. I also want to quickly note that this approach doesn't necessarily require effort data. Um, so we can use log transformed catch data in place of the log transformed catch per unit effort uh, response variable that I'm showing here, uh, which is really nice because as I'm sure many of you know, effort data aren't always available and can be inaccurate in some cases. And finally, I want to give a quick shout out to one of my co-PIs, Ji He, uh, who recently led a really great paper that will help to generalize and advance this modeling approach. Uh, so we may end up adjusting this model structure a little bit based on that excellent work from G. I thought it would be good to quickly show some preliminary results from this approach so you all can see what these year class strength estimates look like. Uh, so these estimates are derived for, from Lake Whitefish data from four regions in Lake Huron. Um, and the data were provided by Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, so in these plots, the x-axis shows the year classes and the y-axis is our index of year class strength, with zero constituting an average year class across years. Uh, so as you can see, we have a nice long time series here, and we were able to estimate year class strength back into the 1970s for some regions. Uh, you can also see that year class strength is pretty variable through time. So one of the first things that jumped out to me with these results is the obvious decline in recruitment in the 2000s for the central Maine Basin and southern Georgian Bay regions. Uh, following consistently strong year classes in the 90s. So this trend lines up pretty well with that figure I showed earlier, showing the decline in uh, biomass for Northern Lake Huron. Uh, but interestingly, while this trend is certainly present for those two regions, we don't see that pronounced decline in the Southern Main Basin or in the North Channel. Uh, so for these regions, year class strength is a little bit more consistent through that time period. All right, so once we've generated our year class strength estimates, our second objective is to identify and rank biophysical drivers of recruitment. Uh, to do that, we need to compile data on potential drivers. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of potential drivers of lake whitefish and Cisco recruitment. So finding and compiling data to describe those drivers and then developing indices from those data that make sense or line up spatiotemporally with the fish data um, is likely going to be one of the biggest challenges that we'll face in this project. Our team has identified about 21 different predictor variables to target for data compilation and inclusion. Uh, these variables include biotic factors like spawning stock size, uh, isobore biomass, the biomass of prey fishes like alewife, rainbow smelt, and round goby, zooplankton densities, including densities of bithotrephes and cercopagus, um, and then densities of key prey item, uh, the key prey item diparia, and also dicenid densities. And our list of variables also includes abiotic and sort of indirectly biotic variables like total phosphorus, secchi depth, uh, chlorophyll A, um, the onset and duration of ice cover, temperature indices like annual spring and summer degree days and winter severity and spring warming rates. Also uh, things like wind speed and direction and water levels. Um, so we know that this is a really ambitious list and that it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to find data for all of these variables for all of the different fish stocks we're looking at. Um, but we're going to do our best to try to cover as many of these variables for as many fish stocks as we can. We're then going to use those data as predictors and generalized, generalized additive models or GAMs and also random forest models to both identify and rank key recruitment drivers and then infer the nature of the relationships between those drivers and recruitment. Uh, for both of these models, our response variable will be those year class strength estimates that we generated for objective one. And we see, uh, we see these two types of models as being highly complementary. So both of them are data-driven approaches, and they have similar inferential goals, but they use fundamentally different algorithms and processes to fit the data. So if we see, for example, similar trends and relationships from both approaches, then we can be all the more confident that those trends and relationships are actually supported by the data. And just as a quick example, I thought it'd be useful to show what some of the outputs of these models look like. On the top here, I have some results from a GAM that Taylor fit to predict uh, larval Cisco catch in Lake Ontario based on, in this case, day of year, distance to shore, and average ice cover duration. Uh, on the bottom are some results from a random forest model from my work on walleye recruitment in Minnesota's large inland lakes. Uh, and in this case, the response variable was walleye year class strength. And I'm showing some uh, results for how year class strength was expected to vary with. Uh, in, uh, in the lower left there, degree days in the first year of life, which is essentially an index of how warm it was in the first growing season. Uh, in the middle, first winter severity or the severity of the first winter following hatch. Um, and then also the spring warming rate in the first growing season. 
So what I want to focus on here is not necessarily the results themselves, uh, but rather the fact that both of these approaches can capture or infer nonlinear relationships between the predictors and the response variables, which is going to be really useful for our work because it's very likely that many of the relationships between our target predictors and Cisco and Lake Whitefish year class strength will indeed be nonlinear. In addition, these models can help to identify important variables or key factors that regulate recruitment. So what I'm showing here is an example of a variable importance plot from a random forest model. Again, these results come from my work on Minnesota walleye populations. And what we can see here is that uh, our index of temperature in the first year of life, degree days at age zero, was by far the most important variable for explaining uh, variance in walleye year class strength. In second place, we had uh, the severity of the first winter after the first growing season as also being pretty important. But then outside of that, pretty much all the other variables were, you know, middling to little importance. Um, so again, this sort of output is going to be really useful as we try to identify key drivers of Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment. So moving on to objective three, uh, this objective has two parts, and the first relates to quantifying synchrony or potentially the lack of synchrony in recruitment, um, as well as drivers of any synchrony that we find. So our research questions for this objective include questions like, is interannual recruitment success among stocks and between species spatially synchronized? What is the spatial scale of any observed synchrony and what biophysical factors might be driving that synchrony? Um, so to address this objective, we're gonna be testing for synchrony by quantifying correlations in year class strength among stocks within a species and also between species. And we'll relate those correlations to the spatial distance among populations to generate estimates of the spatial scale of synchrony. We'll also use those same data-driven approaches that we mentioned earlier to identify and better understand drivers of year class strength. Um, we're going to use those to try to identify and rank important biophysical drivers of any synchrony that we find as well. The second part of this objective focuses on the influence of spatial temporal scale. And our research questions in this case are questions like, in which contexts are local scale biotic processes versus regional scale abiotic processes most important for regulating recruitment? And also questions like how has the relative importance of various drivers changed over time um, and through ecosystem transformations? So our approach for addressing this objective will be to uh, quantify the, de the degree to which different biophysical drivers explain species specific recruitment variability across space. So for example, within lakes versus across lakes, um, and also across time, so for example, before and after major ecosystem regime shifts, uh, in an effort to try to better understand the spatial scales at which these various drivers act, and also the ecosystem contexts in which certain drivers are most important. And our final objective centers on projecting future recruitment and trying to, uh, to identify management actions that may be beneficial for achieving desired outcomes. So our research questions in this case include questions like, how will Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment respond to anticipated impacts of climate change? And also which management interventions are most likely to benefit Cisco and Lake Whitefish stocks? Uh, to address this objective, we plan to simulate multiple scenarios of future climatic conditions, as well as alternative management strategies that relate to the important biophysical drivers that we identify while addressing objectives one through three uh, to better understand both how future climatic conditions might influence recruitment and also what levers managers might be able to pull to help promote successful Cisco and Lake Whitefish recruitment. So to bring it all together here, I thought it might be useful to use this flow chart that we developed uh, to go through this project sort of step by step and to better illustrate how each of these elements and objectives connect with one another. So as you can see here in the legend, uh, the green circles are input data, the blue rectangles are analysis steps, and the orange circles are outputs of analyses. Uh, so we start with the Lake Whitefish and Cisco data that we're currently compiling, and those go into our year class strength estimation models. Uh, those models then generate estimates of year class strength, which are then used in a couple of different analyses. Uh, first, to evaluate recruitment synchrony, and second, to use those GAMs and random forests to identify and better understand the influences of biophysical drivers on recruitment, uh, which we'll be investigating in multiple ways, including by varying spatial and temporal scales of analysis. Uh, and of course, for that step, uh, we'll also need to compile all of the data describing the biophysical drivers themselves. Uh, those analyses will generate a handful of outputs, including estimates of synchrony and drivers of that synchrony, as well as hopefully, as well as a hopefully improved understanding of the importance and influence of various drivers on recruitment, uh, and how that importance and influence may vary across spatial temporal scales. 
And for our final objective, we'll take the results of some of those analyses along with projections of future climate uh, to first predict future year class strength for Cisco and Lake Whitefish across the lakes, and then to use those uh, year class strength projections alongside simulations of different management scenarios to try to identify actionable management strategies that will promote successful recruitment for Whitefish and Cisco in the future. So to wrap things up here, uh, first, I'd just like to say that if you'd like to get involved in this project or if you have any suggestions for data sets or other ideas for drivers or whatnot that you think might be useful for our work, uh, please feel free to reach out and let us know if you'd like to get involved. Uh, we'd be more than happy to collaborate and I'll quickly note that we're gonna be sharing all of our contact information here in just a couple minutes if you wanna connect with us. Um, before I finish, I'd like to mention quickly a couple of complimentary projects that are also ongoing right now. Uh, the first is a project uh, to investigate drivers of Cisco recruitment in Lake Superior, and that project's being led by Lynn Waterhouse, Gretchen Hansen, and their graduate student Olivia Miffler at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this project uses really different analytical approaches from our project, and of course it's more focused on Superior Cisco, uh, so we're excited to stay connected with this group and compare and contrast the results of our different analyses. And hopefully we will collectively arrive at an even deeper and, and uh, even deeper understanding of pregnant recruitment dynamics and drivers in the Great Lakes. And then one last slide here, the, the last project I'll mention is one that was just funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and is being led by my colleague at the Great Lakes Science Center, Ralph Tingley. Uh, so for this project, Ralph and his collaborators, including myself, are going to put together a workshop in which we'll do things like develop conceptual models for early life history for both Cisco and Lake Whitefish. Uh, evaluate the effectiveness of existing sampling targeted at those early life stages, and then make recommendations for ongoing or new sampling targeted at early life stages. Uh, so hopefully through this work, we'll be able to make better mechanistic connections between the drivers and Cisco and Lake Whitefish recruitment, particularly during those early life stages. And of course, the eventual end result will hopefully be improved and coordinated sampling programs that will lead to better data and better indices of recruitment. So at this point, I'm gonna pass it back to Taylor, who's going to uh, walk us through an interactive word cloud exercise uh, to sort of prime our discussion. So Taylor, I'll stop sharing and I'll hand it off to you here. Real quick, Andrew, I see the time is at 1.30. Do we still wanna do the word cloud? Yeah, I mean, I think we're okay. If people um, need to jump off, they can. Um, cool. Generally, these, these have gone 90 minutes sometimes just with the discussion and, you know, so I'd say go for it. Awesome. Well, yeah, um, we could not resist while we have a captive audience full of uh, Craigonine scientists, or at least people who are interested in Craigonines and asking them what they think as we're uh, showcasing this new project and, and trying to get some ideas here. So let me... Share my screen here. Great. So I'll put this link in the chat as soon as Zoom cooperates with me. But basically, we want to just see, and this can be super off the cuff, and we're curious to see what kind of ideas you have, but sort of uh, what you think might be important drivers of contemporary pregnant recruitment. And, you know, we're looking here for, you know, speculation, your pet hypotheses, basically things that, um, you're thinking about and that we should be thinking about in terms of this. Um, we have lots of ideas already, as you've seen, but we're really interested to hear what you think. So you should be able to go to the link I posted in the chat um, and throw in some answers. See some results coming in. Promise you don't need to think too hard about this. Um, really just looking for what you think is important for driving these systems. And then once I get um, get some more answers in here, I'll flip over to the word cloud and we can see what, what pops up. And we're really interested to also hear what you think about what the dominant answers are, if you how much you agree, how much you disagree, all that jazz.
We've got a pretty good number. So maybe I'll pop over and we'll see what we have. Feel free to keep on uh, putting things in here. Wait for that to load. Oh, here we go. Okay, I see ice cover, maybe zooplankton availability, temperature, smell, overfishing. The annoying thing with the word clouds is, of course, if you have a space in the word, it separates it. Sorry. Substrate. Okay, cool. I'll give it another, you know, 15 seconds, get some words in, and then I'll lock it just so we can actually look at it without it switching around. Filtation. UV, that's a good one. One of those uh, emerging stressors, perhaps. Okay, I think we've got a good amount of responses here. Yeah, thanks Taylor for, for uh, leading that for us. This is really cool. It was actually really fun to kind of watch it evolve as well. And um, some of those things stuck as being important. Some of them got smaller, some of them got larger, but yeah, I think a lot of the ones that have come out consistently, ice, zooplankton or prey or food, there's a lot of that in there. Uh, invasives, temperature, uh, availability, I'm guessing that's related to probably prey or maybe spawning habitat. Uh, but yeah, does anybody, I, I guess I'll just open it up. Does anybody have any uh, comments on this or thoughts sort of seeing how these things are coming together? Any questions related to this? Mythos, that's a good one. That's actually uh, not on our list. Yeah, I mean, we are interested in hearing anyone's thoughts about this, um, especially, you know, if your pet hypothesis got mangled in this, but you still want to share it with the world. Um, yeah, yeah, if anybody, I mean, we can also, given the timing here, we're a little bit over, we can also jump to the next one if you want to do that. But uh, real quick, if anybody has any, any thoughts on this before we move over. I see the round in there. And then it's by whitefish, but I don't know if that is a round whitefish interaction that somebody's thinking about. That would be a new idea that I haven't thought about. Just wondered if anybody wanted to expand on that one, uh, that idea, or if that was even related to round whitefish. I'm not sure. Oh, ragobi. There we go. Yeah. Thank you for the obvious, uh, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> we, I was thinking that too, Bo, but yeah, round goby, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> okay. Interesting to see Owen's comment in there too. In Lake Superior, we're wondering if the season during which recruitment is determined has changed. So yeah, I guess climate-related phenological shifts, broadly speaking. Hmm. And then I see a comment from Ellery as well. I wonder how much of the term surrounding Lower trophic levels, zooplankton, mysis primary production relates to the current low nutrient state of the Great Lakes and how we can address that. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. That's one of the, the benefits that we see of including uh, the lower Great Lakes in this analysis, which is, um, you know, looking across those different ecosystem states with um, the upper Great Lakes being more oligotrophic than the lower Great Lakes, thinking about Erie and Ontario, um, looking across that gradient and seeing what pops out in that. Maybe zooplankton is, is much more critical in the upper Great Lakes, for example, whereas that's not a structure they're necessarily facing in every lake. Right, or even within, you know, upper lakes, Saginaw Bay, Green Bay, or if we have, you know, those Simcoe data, there's another case where we can try to explore that gradient a little bit. All right, well, maybe we should hop to the second one, Taylor, uh, just for the sake of time. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, so this one, um, I know there was a few on the last slide that I think relate to this, but you know, in terms of what drivers are currently understudied or emerging, um, I think this is a really interesting question and, and things about how ecosystems have changed over time or sort of novel anthropogenic influences or, or new invasive species, all that fun stuff. These can be potential drivers, specifically Kragenary recruitment, things that you think are currently really important for Great Lake ecosystem dynamics that we should be thinking about um, and thinking about how the ecosystem influences fish populations, you name it. I'll pop over here and see what we've got to start off with. Climate change, big one. UV. Yeah, I kind of figured we would see a big climate or a big climate change right off the bat, and sure enough. Hatcheries was an interesting one. Egg physiology. Oh. I'm really curious to hear about the egg physiology answer. Water levels. Mm -hmm. Epigenetics. Oh, that's a good one relating to both hatcheries and just population stress. Yeah, plasticity in there as well, somewhat in the same, potentially in, the, in a similar category. Thiamine deficiency. Currents. I might uh, lock that there here in a few seconds. Oh. There we go. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody for participating in that. Hopefully you all found it uh, engaging and, and interesting. Um, does anybody in this case want to talk about what they put in? Maybe the, I think you mentioned the egg physiology one or any of these other ones that are maybe uh, not related to some of the really big words in the, in the word cloud. Yeah, I, I, I did egg physiology, just thinking about sedimentation and, and uh, oxygen transport and things like that. Yeah, that's a big one. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, yeah, this is Jory. I'm, I'm thinking, I really like this exercise, and it'd be interesting to repeat in the future as new findings uh, come in. But I'm also wondering if we had maybe a discrete list of terms to draw from, if that would help. You know, there's, there's probably things that people are typing, I know there was for me, um, that would fall under some of these broader categories. Um, and maybe that would help focus the cloud a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, that's a great point, George. Yeah, it's sort of that trade-off between uh, getting people at where their ideas are at before influencing them into narrower categories, or, or right? Um, but then you sort of have this free-for-all where it's hard Absolutely. to really get yeah. themes. But I agree. And you know, using this, we can also construct those themes, although it, it's not useful in the moment right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think we could do something post hoc, right, where we could assign categories where hopefully we're not influencing people a priori and, and pushing them in a certain direction, but we might be able to sort of lump these things together. 
I like that. That'd be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thanks, Jordan. I don't know if Owen Gorman is still on, but I'm curious about his chat message about in Lake Superior, um, the season in which recruitment is determined having changed or that's what they're thinking. Oh, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I think one of the things, uh, this has been an ongoing discussion, for example, uh, we usually determine um, uh, your class strength based on age ones in spring or early summer sampling and um, other lakes do it at different times. So that's one of sort of a disconnect in whether we're using the same language. But this fall, we have had uh, enormous numbers of age zero show up in the late fall. We were doing this CSMI sampling into early October. Um, so we will be following that. We've just never seen anything like this. And of course, these age zeros at this later, not much different in size than the ones we'll see next spring. Um, and this gets back to, let me see, I'm trying to remember the Purdue uh, biologist a number of years ago that looked at the effects of winter uh, starvation on Cisco's. Uh, somebody might be able to help me with that person. He went up to Alaska. Um, and you know there we're wondering about whether um, overwinter mortality or starvation or other things may be taking a, a role in this plus predation. Um, and we definitely have a lot of predators in Lake Superior. So you have this gauntlet of predators all through the winter. So these are this this has our our heads are spinning on this and we're we're wait with with great anticipation to see how this comes out. I'm wondering if there, if, if things have been changing, um, what is the best time to determine when your class strength uh, may be set? And I think um, if you look at many of these factors, particularly climate change may be driving the change in phenology here and you know a whole bunch of other factors. As Jory was saying, I think you could take a lot of these things and put them into different bins and simplify them, but they, um, yeah, it, this is a fascinating um, process that you've presented here. Yeah, thanks, Owen. That's super interesting. And yeah, the news of the huge catches in Superior this year has reverberated across the basin. That's super interesting. And I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see if you're still finding them in the spring. I hope so. And maybe this is one of those year classes. Oh, and that they'll, uh, the population will hang its hat on for a little while. So hopefully that's the case. All right. Well, uh, maybe we should just go to our uh, final slide quickly, Taylor. Thanks again, everybody, for participating in this exercise. But just in the interest of time, uh, here's our contact information in case you need it. Um, again, feel free to reach out to us to ask us about either of the projects that we've talked about today. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to discuss them with you further. Um, and yeah, we can open it up if, if we have time and if folks are interested in staying on to uh, any other questions. I guess I'll leave it up to Bo and Nick if they want to keep it open or if we, should, if we need to, to end it here. I think we can keep it open for a little bit. If anybody has any other comments that uh, weren't addressed in the chat or um, could be on either of these talks, that we heard today. And I'll just quickly echo that we, you know, definitely reach out if you're interested in being involved. Um, we are really excited to try and tackle this basin wide, but that also means we need uh, basin wide expertise to help us solve uh, a lot of these questions that we're interested in. So, um, yeah, please welcome to reach out. All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. I'm not seeing any new chat messages. I know it's a gorgeous, unseasonably warm day here in Ann Arbor. I don't know how it is where you all are joining us from today, but um, yeah, maybe this is it. Thanks so much to Andrew and Taylor for Fantastic complimentary presentations. Feel free to reach out to them about either of these uh, projects.
projects they spoke about today, one completed, one just uh, beginning. And um, we hope that you will join us next month, December the 2nd, I believe, where the focus will be on describing uh, the diversity with genetics and morphology of the Deepwater Cisco uh, community there. And so I know it'll be a really great talk uh, with some really surprising and exciting results based on what we saw presented at uh, the Joint Aquatic Sciences meeting in Grand Rapids a few months ago. Anything else from you, Nick? <laughs>